Uh, again, good evening, everybody that is with us today. Uh, I'm Elida Perez, a reporter for El Paso Matters, uh, El Paso's nonprofit, nonpartisan news source. Uh, I've also been covering mental health issues that have developed throughout the pandemic. Thank you for joining us for the second of our conversations with El Pasoans. It's an ongoing series where we'll talk with community leaders about important, important issues that we face. Uh, we're continuing our conversation series with three of our local mental health experts, Dr. Mary Liner, Dr. Melanie Longhurst, and Dr. Shivani Mehta. I think stigma, um, even though like Dr. Liner pointed out, um, there are more people who are becoming aware and we are able to host a seminar like this and we are actually able to talk about it openly. Um, there's still a lot of work we can do. Um, when we talk about stigma in, uh, uh, in our community like El Paso, which is so unique in so many different ways, um, there are, this, is a, this is a community where I feel um, everything is about families, everything is like family structured. And so people want to fix it in the family like the idea of why should I talk to a stranger to get myself fixed or get myself better? That idea is so prevalent that that kind of kind of you know becomes a big challenge for anybody wanting to come out, right? Um, it became even more. Um, uh, it became even more bigger problem because within the family you don't say anything to anybody else. So even if somebody is getting hurt or somebody is. Um, you know, somebody is um, uh, being abused, you know, you don't say anything, it's within the family. So I think, you know, um, I think it's a very, very important uh, thing to kind of talk about, not just because we want everybody to get help, but it's also because it's, it's like a voice, we, we need to make everybody feel safe, it's okay to talk about it. And one more thing I would really, and I'm sorry, I'm really passionate about this, but one more thing I'd really want to kind of highlight with stigma, what also comes in is how we express, like Dr. Leitner said, um, how we express um, what we feel, right? So everybody says, oh, I have a lot of headache. I have a lot of stomach aches. So with a lot of times it's okay to say I have headache or stomach ache, but it's not okay to say I have anxiety, I have depression. So I think, the way you interpret that and the way you get help also changes with that. And I think that also kind of um, becomes a, a big reason why uh, people don't get the kind of help they want or they need. And Dr. Longhurst? Hi, I'm Melanie Longhurst. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and assistant professor at Texas Tech Health Sciences Center of El Paso. And I too am very passionate about this topic. Um, I'm also, in, in addition to seeing patients and being the psychology training director, I'm also a behavioralist in the Department of Family Medicine, so working in primary care. And the importance of that is because it helps to reduce stigma and increase access to mental health to our community. So like Dr. Dr. Zleiner and um, Metha both mentioned, there are many challenges and barriers to seeking um, care. And so many patients, even though they're presenting with these issues of depression and anxiety, oftentimes don't seek specialty mental health. So they'll never see a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a counselor for treatment. So they oftentimes go to primary care. And when you think about it, it's because, as Dr. Metha mentioned, it almost is more acceptable to people to share that they have physical symptoms, that they have a medical condition. But when it comes to mental health issues, you know, people don't often feel comfortable talking about them. And culturally, yes, we also have that issue where things remain in the family, we'll take care of it within the family. We don't speak of these things outside of the family. And so people then become a little concerned when you know they're asked to disclose or they're asked questions about mental health and they may not respond you know, candidly. But as Dr. Mehta mentioned, there are a lot of psychosomatic symptoms. So our body doesn't lie. Um, so even if we don't recognize within ourselves that we're feeling stress or anxiety or feeling down, our body may be giving us signals that we are feeling such a way. And so there are often cases where 
patients present to their doctors, uh, you know, their physicians, and they'll say something like, I've been having a lot of stomach issues and I, I don't know what to do about it or I'm having, I feel like I'm having a heart attack and might die. And so they'll run through all these medical tests and there's nothing really that they can, you know, identify that's causing these issues. And oftentimes it's um, mental health, you know, stress, anxiety, depression that is, that we're feeling in our bodies. And so it's really important to recognize how this intersection and, and that's what I'm really passionate about too, this intersection between mental health and medical issues. But one thing I've noticed that I, I perhaps am holding on to as a silver lining to the pandemic is that I have noticed um, anecdotally that more people are coming out and expressing that they are struggling. Um, I've seen this through social media. I've seen this among my own family and friends. I've seen this in primary care. A lot of patients really expressing that they're having um, challenges. Now that's unfortunate when you think about how prevalent now these issues are and the pandemic has, you know, recent research has shown that stress is definitely on the increase and um, various factors have been adding to that um, throughout the pandemic, throughout the past year. So that's unfortunate. However, I think the fact that people are more um, open to expressing that they're having these challenges also allows other people to share, you know what, I'm feeling the same way, or thank you for sharing that. I've been seeing a lot of people post about, you know, this is for my friends and family who don't, who's, who are struggling with something they don't talk about. And then that kind of gives insight to somebody else to say, oh, you know, maybe I'm struggling with something that I'm not talking about. And they're more willing and open. And I think that that is, is huge because it's normalizing and validating that this has been hard. This has been tremendously challenging um, for, again, various reasons. There's a lot of anxiety, feeling down, a lot of loss, and not just loss of, of, of life, which has been enormous, but also lo loss of life as we know it, how we interact, a lot of isolation. And so we can go on and on, um, you know, talking about this, but we've all lived it in the last year and a half. So I'm sure we can identify for ourselves even the struggles that we've faced. And I can honestly say that I've had a very challenging year and I'm a professional, but most of all, and first and foremost, I'm, I'm human. And so um, I hope that we can continue to have these conversations and these discussions. So I'm very thankful that we have this opportunity today. Speaking of which, let, let's talk about access to counseling or mental health services during the pandemic. Uh, we know there is a shortage of therapists on the border as it is. Uh, some people had mentioned having a really hard time uh, scheduling appointments. Uh, what changes have been made to address that issue? Uh, and did you find more people reaching out uh, for these types of services and care? And we'll go ahead and start with Dr. Mehta for this one. Okay. So yes, definitely we've seen increased number of uh, people reaching out, increased number of people like Dr. Longhar said, like more, um, uh, uh, more phone calls, um, uh, uh, have been made, and you know, I think one of the things that changed with um, with pandemic was um, uh, introduction or you know, uh, utilizing telehealth has become so prevalent now. Like um, I think before the pandemic, my I, I myself I was very skeptical about using the uh, telehealth. Um, I, I I never thought that um, the the in, uh, in the like one to one interactions can be replaced even for men, uh, for psychiatric evaluations things like that but you know with pandemic with everything else we we adapted and you know telehealth became a real thing uh, telepsychiatry became a real thing tele um, uh, teletherapy became a real thing and so i think that increased the, the access to a lot of people um i um so that is one of the big things that came out. Um, as far as the number of people practicing, I don't think that changed. Um, I think there are more people trying to do more work, but um, you know, there has always been a limitation 
But one of the, and the other challenge that came about was a lot of, um, a lot of patients would get uh, their treat because we we are a border city. A lot of patients would travel and get a lot uh, they get their care across the border, and that stopped with the border closing down. So, um, a lot of people they started seeking help in the traditional route. So that also changed. Um, people um, were uh, so so. I'm not just saying that suddenly number of you know uh, services increased, but I think we are trying to find uh, and be creative about the, the ways we can help people um, in, in the best possible way. Uh, I think one of the biggest thing that came about was uh, primary care physicians and they became one of the biggest uh, uh, support and the, uh, they, they started screening a lot of patients for uh, psychiatric uh, conditions and care. Um, I think uh, that that helped a lot of people jumpstart their treatment rather than just wait for um, patients to, uh, to get that mental health care. So I think everybody working together as a team is uh, what kind of came out of um, uh, this, uh, this challenge the, uh, during pandemic. Um, we still need a lot of lot more a uh, lot more providers uh, to meet the need, uh, but but I think a lot of it is work in progress. Now that slowly, slowly things are opening up, more and more people ha have started doing in-person therapy and psychiatric care, etc. And I think that has also um, started. Um, uh, 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 that has also started like people, more people getting care. Dr. Liner, is there anything you'd like to chime in on that form? Yes, um, actually, this is a great question, and it's a lot. It's not now when we are very worried about this. I think that the things as they look in the past and in the future seem to indicate that mental health is going to be a big issue. It's probably going to be soon the first disease that we have the highest prevalence of problems everywhere. And this pandemic has put a, a big pressure on it. So uh, without any doubt, it's, in, it's very good that the primary care physicians, as the pediatricians can detect problems and can help. And also that it has been more professionals being prepared in, in fact, there is a fellowship in El Paso and that it has, in Texas Tech, and it has been a great job of Dr. De Vargas in, in doing that. But I wanted to tell you briefly a small story. I was very happy that we were detecting a lot of more children. They have psychosocial and behavioral problems. And maybe because of stigma or maybe because the questionnaires and scales use were maybe not appropriate for the people of our community. We were detecting very low prevalence of psychosocial and behavioral problems to call them instead of mental health. And I didn't believe it because children are having a harder life. You know, it's different than when I was a child. Of course, all of you are very much younger, but I'm sure that you can say the same. It was easier to be a child before. So then I didn't believe that. So then I make this scale with pictures and these pictures detected a lot of children. And I was so happy that I could do that. Then I went with the pediatrician and I said, here, I have all these kids and what are we going to do? And then we start looking at who was going to take care of them. And even if it's more people, it's never going to be enough. Then I thought that all that we have to do, not all, part of what we have to do is to prevent mental health problems. And it sounds like something impossible. How are you going to prevent mental health problems? I strongly believe that if you have certain behaviors that you use all the time, those behaviors become as the way to communicate. 
And those behaviors are not the most appropriate thing that you should do. Is for example, let's just talk about uh, aggression. If you live in, in a surrounding where everybody's being aggressive and you become an aggressive person, eventually you don't even think there's something different. And that becomes a clinical. And Dr. De Vargas, who works in the psychiatry department, and me have been presenting workshops in several forums where she has said that I'm right, that it can be prevented, not all of it, but some can be prevented. And so then what I did is I focused on the behavior that the children have, educating the parents to modify those behaviors because many of the parents have those behaviors too. And because they have them, they think that it's fine to act that way or they were like that when they were children. So the big issue here is for everybody to be the best that they can be. I think that we have to focus in prevention as well as protect all these people like Dr. Meta and Dr. Longhorse that can take care of the people who already have a problem. Now we're going to be moving to some questions from our audience here shortly. So we wanna to try to make sure to get in as many questions as we possibly can. Uh, that being said, I'm gonna move on to the topic of uh, reopening, right? So we've all seen the stress and anxiety that was created by families having to stay at home for the better part of last year, right? To slow the spread of COVID-19. Um, so if you can each briefly talk about um, what some concerns have been brought up about the community reopening now that more people have been vaccinated, you know, what are a few things you can suggest to people uh, who may be dealing with a new set of worries related to having to be out in public or back in work settings? Uh, Dr. Longhurst, we'll start with you. Sure. Yeah, I've, I've been hearing about this a lot, um, quite a bit, especially, I think, for many folks, the, the biggest concern that I've heard, it has been surrounding the kind of how rapid it's happened. And so I, I think a lot of folks thought it was going to be this gradual reopening. And they feel kind of this rush, I think, in some, you know, places or institutions are being told, okay, so now you can, you know, come in here. And I recently heard, you know, just do the the media, um, you know, certain stores no longer requiring masks and whatnot. And I know a lot of people are feeling like, oh my gosh, this is happening a lot sooner than I anticipated. Um, and so that's that's one big one. And I think um, Drs. Leiner and, and Metha can probably speak to what they've been hearing in their clinics, um, especially around the kids, because I know that they work more frequently with children. And then there's uh, the pot, like they can't get vaccinated, right? Right. Especially the younger ones, which is something that I have very young children and that is a concern for us. Um, so when I think of how to manage some of this anxiety surrounding this experience of we're now we're getting kind of thrown into or thrust into this and I, you know, I've had a year and a half adapting to being isolated and you know, getting comfortable at home or wherever we may be. And now this is happening really fast. I think of there are still measures in place that we can each as individuals take in order to keep ourselves and our families safe, right? And so one is kind of recognizing that if you are vaccinated, and so I am, um, there's already this high level of protection. And then I can still take it upon myself to pick and choose, you know, maybe not with work, but at work, I can still maintain distance, even if it's not required, right? It's it, just because something isn't required, these restrictions aren't required. It doesn't mean that you're now required to be like, you know, shoulder to shoulder. <laughs> and so really kind of thinking of that. So the restrictions may be dropped, but we can still maintain our own boundaries, which should be done anytime, right? We should still be able to maintain our own, own boundaries. You can still wear a mask if you choose. So while they're not required, if you decide that that is what you feel most comfortable with, then you can do that. So I remind myself and I remind um, the 
people that I work with that we can still maintain these precautions for ourselves should we choose. We can still choose to engage in certain behaviors if we feel most comfortable with that. So if we're invited to an outing, we can decide whether or not we wanna go depending, is it outdoors? It is, is it inside? Is it gonna be a large gathering, a smaller gathering? And that's okay. Do I wanna wear a mask even though other people aren't? Am I comfortable with that? And if so, then we can make our decisions to go. I know a lot of people that I've, I'm friends with and, and family who um, I, I don't even ask, but they share, you know, I'm gonna have a gathering, we're gonna be outside and we're all vaccinated. So they, they kind of share all that information in order to kind of reduce kind of some of the anxiety that some people might be going through. And so I think that's helpful, just reminding ourselves that we still have control and power in certain domains, even when we're asked to go, go in here. And we know by now what are some of the things that are effective. So we know about the vaccines, we know about the masks. And so taking all of these pr protective measures, the social distancing, um, good hygiene. So there are some things that you can still practice, you know, good um, hand hygiene. And I think um, another part is habits and behaviors are really hard to change. And so we've had a year and a half where many of us are, have grown accustomed to washing our hands a certain way, um, maintaining distance in a certain way, wearing masks. And so I imagine that it's gonna be kind of challenging to unravel some of those behaviors. It's kind of weird now, you know, if you go out and you don't see someone with a mask, I'm like, whoa, what's this? This is, this is strange, right? And I'm not just like hugging people, you know, we're like, there's this awkward kind of dance of like, do I, do I shake your hand? Do I like fist bump? I mean, do we just stand here and wave, air hug? Like, you know, we don't know what we're doing. So as a behavioralist, I really appreciate the fact that um, habits are hard to break. And I think we've all kind of built these habits surrounding kind of protecting us and some to more degree than others. But I think that that serves us well in this sense, because we'll still be able to practice those um, for a longer run as we're feeling comfortable. And Dr. Mehta or Dr. Liner, would either of you like to chime in on this as well? I'll say something really brief. I think that is very important for children to, to remember that they are going to look at how their parents act. And I have had a chance to talk with many children and some of them are very excited of the opportunity to go back to school soon. And others are completely out of it. They don't want to go back to school. They think they are going to be sick, especially like patients they have chronic diseases. They think that they are going to be sick as soon as they return. And some of them think that school was hard before and now it's going to be harder because they lost the complete the year and, and they're not very far from a reality. There are going to be some steps back that they are going to have. But I think one important thing is to explain to children what it is, what can happen. And the thing is that we know there is a possibility that we have to go back to the house because something else happened because maybe there is a mutation of the virus or maybe it's a different one but now we have survived this and we know how to act so I think it's very important to model very well for your children and to explain them that like Dr. Longhorst did she just said it has been hard to go here and now we're going to go back and some are going to be very happy and some not. So we're going to move on to, we've gotten a couple of questions from our audience. And since we're, uh, time is of the essence, it's amazing how quickly time goes by when you think an hour will last forever, right? <laughs> so one of the first questions that we got, and it relates to a previous question I was going to ask, so I'm going to go ahead and, and use it at this time, um, is is how do we get people that are historically bad or have a bad mindset about therapy or, or seeking out counseling or help? Um, how do we get those people to go and, and get treatment for themselves or, or reach out for help for that matter? That's the first of our audience questions we'll be asking. And um, 
I'll let I any one of you decide to to answer first and chime in. And I ask again that we uh, keep it brief so we can get to some more questions. I'll really briefly just state, and then um, Dr. Mehta or Dr. Leiner can step in, is I think modeling our own vulnerability. And so it can be challenging, right? For instance, with parents, maybe some of our older um, old, older folks who are trying to demonstrate to us that you know our, their strength because they don't wanna worry their children or their adult children. And so sometimes it takes us as the, as the, the children to demonstrate that vulnerability and to almost model how to do that and, and note like, oh, hey, it's okay and bring it up um, where we don't have to, you know, you don't have to stay strong and it's not weak to talk about these things. So I think model modeling our own vulnerability and kind of so much as, you know, disclosing more than we're comfortable sharing, but also simply asking something like, how are you? How have you been? You know, I've noticed a lot of people are feeling a lot of anxiety. Have you been okay? And, and just even posing the question, even to people who may typically not open up can sometimes result in them you know, disclosing. And if they don't, that's also okay. But I think oh, we don't know until we open up those lines of communication, both demonstrating or sharing how we may be feeling and then asking somebody else how they're doing can really show them that you care, that you're interested and that it's okay for them to talk about it with you. And one of the questions in our chat kind of tied into that as well, but also relates to how you help your parents, right? I mean, a lot of times it's easy for siblings to interact with each other and, and go behind closed doors and just hash things out between themselves. But um, uh, how does that, how do you help your parents if you notice um, something's going on or if you want to reach out to them as well? One of the things I wanted to kind of mention, um, you know, about getting somebody who's not really open to getting help, right? Um, I think one of, like Dr. Longher said, like, you know, um, um, you ask them questions. Um, another thing that I have found is a lot of times um, they are, especially parents, um, elderly uh, who've had like, tremendous uh, losses, losses of milestones, losses of, uh, um, you know, other family members, things like that. They are much more, uh, and we, you know, um, they're much more likely to open up to their uh, people they trust. So um, uh, if they are going to any church or any religious institution, people who they, they, have, they have known for a long time, um, they might be more willing to open to open up to them, or um, you know, uh, I've also had uh, like uh, the, I've also had patients who've told me the only way they could get their parents to come in was they went to their primary care physician, who they knew for years, and they they kind of were able to talk to them, and the primary care physician was able to convince them to get a little bit more help, or you know, to kind of try, ex explain to them that maybe you know you can, it's okay to get an extra help or extra care. Um, a lot of uh, uh, recently, and um, uh, I've mentioned this before also telehealth, right? A lot of support groups have opened up and that has made it, made it easier because a lot of them are virtual. So if you are not feeling as comfortable talking about what's going on or if the, if, if anyone is not feeling that good about like sharing, uh, they can start with not having to, you know, turn on the camera and then slowly, slowly, depending upon what kind of group it is, they get, try to get more comfortable. So, you know, uh, again, um, you know, the, the key is like Dr. Longher said, start starting the conversation because once we start, we are able to start that conversation, then we can try to see a lot of different things or we can try to figure out a lot of different people who we can approach. But that starting that conversation, being able to identify, I think becomes one of the biggest, biggest key in getting help. Dr. Liner, do you have anything to briefly add on that one before we move on? 
Um, I was not going to say anything, but I thought in something from listening to Dr. Meta and Dr. Longhurst. And it's something that I have been teaching my students and teaching in the conference I have been talking about is be kind as people how they are doing. And when they tell you how they are doing, listen to them because it can make a big difference. Often we say things, you know, like mental health, forget it, not me. And when we say those things, people hear that and it becomes that stigma that you are talking about. But I think when we say things, and I think that is a very good strategy. For example, I have accepted that I, during these months, I have had anxiety. I never had it in my life before, or maybe I didn't recognize it before because it has been a really hard time. So it's a good way to do it, to say, times have been hard for everybody. How are you feeling? And then, you know, sometimes it's necessary to go and look for somebody to help you because it's not only that it's not enough professionals, it's the fact that you don't want to do that because this is stigmatizing. You go to see a mental health provider, you are crazy. And it's not that. We have time for one more uh, topic slash question before we uh, move on here. So. Uh, this one's kind of looking ahead, right? I'm sure it's difficult to know what the long-term impacts of the pandemic will have for people in the future as far as mental health goes. Um, but if you can briefly talk about what problems you foresee being more prevalent in the future, um, maybe how they can be detected and how people can prevent some behaviors from uh, emerging and becoming clinical issues. So we have just a couple more minutes before we move on. Um, Dr. Liner, will you go ahead and uh, briefly talk about this one? I, it's, I Thank you. I think that one of the things that I have been working for a few months is in making kits for parents that parents, they, I, I, my focus is on children. So then I don't know a lot about older people and I'm not saying that it's not important. But in the case of the children, I think that if the parents understand what is anxiety and what is depression and what is aggressive behavior and uh, the Society of Pediatrics have been making kits for physicians, but I'm, we are working to make kits for parents and to give it to parents when they go to our clinic where we explain them what is anxiety, what they can do, and if, if they maybe have a talk with the primary care physician, and we're going to plan to do this with comics so people feel that it's very easy to understand the issues. Because I think that there's going to be some problems that are going to come out in few months and some are going to keep come over years because it has been some major thing that happened to us. And I really strongly think that the primary care physicians should help the specialists like Dr. Meta and Dr. Longhorst, like taking care of the patients that do not have a clinical problem, but they, they can kind of deal with it before they go with them. And it's a very big thing for a pediatrician or a family care provider or, or because it is very hard, it's new for them. And I think that what they are doing to educate the pediatricians in how to help is going to be a very helpful. I want to do a lot of education with parents and to children, to children that understand what, that what is happening to them is that they are anxious and maybe they can do some breathing exercises or something that is going to help them to be better. And as you know, I produce cartoons. So I have been putting a lot of cartoons in reference to anxiety. Dr. Mehta? So, um, so, you know, the big, the key words are, um, you know, uh, looking forward, we are, you know, of course, stress, uh, burnout, um, you know, sadness, depression, grief, bereavement, these are some of the big issues that are going to keep coming forward. Um, whichever age we see, kids to elderly, um, you know, everybody has different uh, things uh, that have suddenly changed. The world as we knew is not going to be the same looking forward. We are always going to be more careful. We are always going to be on the um, on the lookout, we're always going to be washing our hands, 
so many times and you know we are always going to be afraid of the germs and we are always going to be stocking the kleenexes and you know the clorox and all that good stuff right um but you know one of the other things that i have seen uh in my practice which is kind of a little bit of a concern but which has been growing is um comparing like you know the social media and comparing myself to other people um uh, not feeling good enough, self-image issues. And I have seen increasing and alarming, incre alarmingly increasing number of kids and adults who are, um, you know, engaging in uh, different uh, ways of uh, changing their diet, modifying body image issues, and leading up to eating disorders. And even though this was commonly known before but now with everybody comparing themselves and you know fear of missing out and you know um some of the um some of the other things that has been one of the key things that are that is coming out in a lot of children Ex uh, exercising or excessive exercising eating not right skipping meals you know things like that those are some of the issues that are coming out and um that is one conversation i've had to have with multiple kids Another, another big thing that has come out is um, social media, video games, and electronics addiction. And I'm saying the word addiction because I've had uh, people who, ha if they didn't, they were not had access to it. You know, um, they've had like serious um, feeling of, oh my God, something is missing in my life. Um, so if they were not able to check in in their Facebook certain number of times or if they were not able to play the video game certain number of hours or you know if I couldn't master this level of Fortnite or whatever it is so you know I think those are some of the other issues that have come into light more recently which were which are apart from the the other stress and anxiety and depression that we were talking about Another thing that I have also seen, and I, I, um, maybe I'll ask Dr. Longhurst what she thinks, is this unmotivation. And it's not necessarily all depression, but it's just like, I don't know what to do. I'm kind of stuck in a limbo, almost like languishing, but not really doing anything. Like this just stuck there. And, you know, it's not really depression. It's not really anxiety. It's just, I don't know where to go from here. And this is something that has come up quite a lot recently and which, is, um, which has been a pretty um, interesting conversation with a lot of people. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're speaking of mental health. We are now going to have uh, Dr. Longhurst uh, help us do an exercise in mindfulness. Uh, so we hope that everybody participates. We'll be playing, paying close attention. So Dr. Longhurst, I ask you to uh, please lead us through this and everybody keep an open mind as we learn a, learn a tool here. Yes. And so really quickly though, yes, Dr. Mehta, you're right. A lot of people are experiencing, experiencing languishing. And so some of the things that could be helpful are doing things that you enjoy, that you find yourself to enjoy and start small. So even if it's, for instance, um, painting, you know, starting to first buy the tools on one day and then trying it out little by little each day. And so by doing that and doing it in small increments, we show ourselves and increase our confidence and then it builds on it, that energy starts to build. Um, but it is something that a lot of people are struggling with. And so trying to find more meaningful activities to us to engage in, and then attention, it's hard to pay attention. We have a lot of distractions. So even right now, my dog's barking outside. I know my kids are in another room. I'm trying to hope that they, I'm hoping that they don't like start, you know, throwing temper tantrums or something as I lead this exercise. So mindfulness is something that can help us train our attention. So strengthen our attention, strengthen our ability to bring our attention back to whatever we're focused on. And I know Dr. Liner, um, this is an area that she's also studying pretty closely. Um, and so the purpose of mindfulness, just so you all know, is not necessarily to relax or feel relaxed. Although a lot of people do by the nature of the exercise. So if you're not feeling that, 
that's okay. The purpose is to focus on what I'm going to be talking to you about. And then we're going to bring our attention back to the present moment. Very gently, don't judge yourself if you're having trouble doing it. And this is what's called a leaves on a stream exercise. I'm taking this script from the Cincinnati VA. It's a really neat script. And the purpose of this particular exercise is to notice a shift from looking from the perspective of your thoughts to looking at your thoughts. So it's just noticing them, not trying to change them or control them in any way. And many of us struggle with anxiety because we're worried about all the things that we can't control. We're worried about the future. And so mindfulness helps to bring us to the here and now. So it, it takes us out of our heads from thinking about the future and worrying and feeling anxious about things that we don't know if they'll happen or not. And it takes us out of thinking about the past and you know that can really drag us down and bring us down. So I encourage you to get into a comfortable position. Um, it's best if you have both feet on the ground, sitting comfortably in a chair and allowing your eyes to close if you feel comfortable doing so. If you're not comfortable with that, you can maintain a soft gaze in front of you. And as you settle into your chair, I invite you to take three deep breaths. With each inhale, notice the air maybe feeling a little cooler or cleaner as it goes in. And with each exhale, noticing how the air feels a little warmer. And now I invite you to turn your attention to your body as it's sitting right here in the chair. Maybe noticing where your body is touching the chair, some places lightly, others more fully. And just notice that it doesn't take any effort at all to be right here where you are. And now I'd like you to picture in your mind a beautiful, vast field and as you bring that image to mind, see if you can imagine that the room around you begins to fade away and that you find yourself in the middle of that pleasant field. Perhaps it's on a warm, sunny day like today and you can feel the sun on your skin or maybe even a little breeze in the air. Maybe you can smell some of the coolness in the air. And as you look across this field, at the far distant end, you see a tree and you start walking toward that tree. With each step, you become more and more present with where you are. Finally, you start to approach that tree and you go over to it and notice that it's on the edge of a creek. You decide to take a seat next to the creek bed and place your hands down on the ground, feeling the coolness of the earth against your hands. And as you make your way to a seated position, you look up and you can see the sun peeking through the trees. You can see the leaves rocking back and forth in the treetops. And as the wind makes its way across them, you look below and you notice a stream and you can see it flowing gently across the rocks and trees descending downhill. You can hear the sound of water trickling, splashing against the rocks. And once in a while, a large leaf drops down into the stream and floats down it. You watch it float by at its own pace. And now I invite you to become conscious of your thoughts. Each time a thought pops into your head, I invite you to imagine that it's written on one of those leaves. If you think in words, you can place those words on a leaf. If you think in images, you can place those images on a leaf. The goal here is gonna to be to stay beside the stream and allow the leaves on the stream to keep flowing by. You're not trying to change it by making the stream go faster or slower. You don't have to worry about changing what you find on the leaves, what your thoughts are, or how the stream looks. So just focusing on every time you have a thought, placing it on a leaf. 
And so perhaps you might have a thought such as this is really relaxing. You would place that on a leaf. Or maybe you have a thought like, I don't know if I'm doing this right. That would go on a leaf as well. So really focusing on just placing your thoughts on the leaf and watching them float by on the stream. And when your mind wanders, because it will, and you notice that you stop having thoughts on those leaves, just notice that your mind has wandered and without judgment, gently bring yourself back to putting that thought on a leaf. For instance, I've stopped having thoughts on a leaf and you would place that there. So again, noticing that it doesn't take any effort at all and that without any struggle, your thoughts will come and they will go. Notice what it's like to watch your thoughts from this more detached place, to look at your thoughts rather than from the perspective of your thoughts. Just continuing, continuing to practice this. Again, bringing your attention back to the exercise if you start to lose focus. And now I'd like you to maybe see the last of the few leaves as they come down the stream, putting your final thoughts on those leaves. And now I invite you to bring your awareness back to your body, seeing if you can have a sense of what it's like to be sitting there on that creek bank. And as you stand up feeling more present and grounded, imagining you're starting to walk back across the field from where you came. And you get to the end of that field from where you started. I'd like you to now bring your attention back to your breath taking a few deep breaths in and out. And without opening your eyes quite yet, I ask you to bring your awareness back to where your body is right now, in the present moment, sitting in this chair, picturing in your mind what the room will look like when you do open your eyes. And when you're ready, Go ahead and open your eyes. And I invite you to carry the intention of bringing this mindfulness exercise into your life throughout the rest of today and throughout other days. And so that is what is formally called a thought diffusion exercise. So it's really helping you to, to kind of separate yourself from these thoughts. And that's really hard when all day long, that's all we've got. But it's good practice, again, to bring yourself to the present moment and just watching those thoughts come and go, not getting tangled up into them, not grabbing hold of them, not seeing them as fact, not judging yourself for having those, thought, those thoughts, but just simply noticing that a thought will come and it'll go just as quickly if you let it and you don't hang on to it. And so hopefully um, that introduced you to a new type of exercise and hopefully you can practice that. Um, and put that into your toolbox whenever you're feeling anxious and worried and caught up in, in your own thinking. Excellent. Thank you so much. Well, we're at the end of our time tonight. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, doctors, again, for taking time to share your thoughts with us. Um, please go to ElPasoMatters.org to see our unique in-depth reporting about our region. Uh, our journalism is made possible by support from people like you. So please consider becoming a member of El Paso Matters if you're not already. Uh, Michaela, our audience development director, uh, is going to drop a link in the chat uh, to our donation page and our free newsletter subscription page. She'll also provide a couple of resources for the audience for phone numbers to call for help or guidance. Uh, we'll be announcing our next uh, events in the newsletter, so definitely sign up to find out when that will be and who it will be. Our goal is to have these talks once a month and eventually transition into in-person events when it's safe for everybody to do so. 
Uh, thank you again uh, for joining us this evening and good night to everybody. Thank you again. Thanks to invite us. Thank you for being with all of you.